books were everywhere, and everywhere I looked there were more books, and all those books, neatly stacked and arrayed on rough-hewn, heavy blackwood shelves and great bookcases that rose from floor to ceiling, all radiating out like the spokes of a wheel from a hub where sat a large circular desk from beneath which I had emerged like a moth from its cocoon, stiff and awkward. Circling all around me were so many books it made me dizzy just to look at them, to realize that not only might there be this many books in the world, but that there could be this many books in a single room. There were tall, vellum-bound volumes above me, and huge, dusty tomes below me. Behind me there were string-tied manuscripts of varied sizes, and at my front, newer, smaller, ornate registered covered in dark Morocco leather. I would like to say that in the full moonlight that shone from windows high above, that the room took on the color of dark honey and the amber charm of old libraries. But that would be to lie. It is the sort of nonsense Pop Joy would like me to paint, or that Miss Anne might write. The truth was that the room was a shifting labyrinth of grey and blue shades, ugly and sinister. So that is just uh, a taste of uh, the writing from Gold's Book of Fish, which I am here to talk about. Um, this book is astoundingly beautiful in the way it's written. I didn't even choose the best passage to read. I just thought I chose like the most kind of relevant passage to booktube, so a book, passage about books. Um, so this is a book about a book about an author who's writing a book. It's kind of convoluted um, in its idea there, but it's, it's very beautifully and masterfully done. Um, it's a book about a history that never happened because it was never actually really written down. Even more confusing. It's a book where everyone is beautifully insane, including the narrators. Um, so this is the story of Hammett, a modern-day Tasmanian forger, who um, discovers this manuscript of William Below Gold, who's a real character, a real character, a real person. Um, and he um, was sent um, to uh, Tasmania when it was a penal um, colony and he was forced to paint fish. This is the real part of the story. Um, but then he finds this manuscript, which is the, the fish that he painted, an actual book that was published during his lifetime and is well um, valued in Tasmanian and Australian literature and in art in general. Um, but this isn't an ordinary manuscript because it's all over the place. Um, um, it's kind of written in different inks um, and different colors, um, meaning that the ink is derived from everything from blood, um, from sea life, from crushed gems, to uh, excuse me, uh, fecal matter. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's all written one way and then the other way and all over the place. And it's kind of like this jumble. Um, this Hammett person becomes so obsessed with this book um, that one day when it all of a sudden vanishes, he decides that he has to rewrite it from memory. Um, but first, in order to do this, he has to become a fish. Um, <laughs> Yes, it seems a little confusing, but it's all very beautifully done and um, beautifully written. Um, so then the written story um, is the story of Billy Gold, um, who's transported to a penal colony, made to paint fish, um, and his, his life there, and the different characters that he encounters, which I said are all quite beautifully insane in that... Um, they have these grandiose ideas, and these grandiose ideas come to life, um, but they never really succeed in what they are meant to do, and it is just so, you know, wonderfully done, and his part in, in helping it all along is beautiful as well. Um, so my actual review, instead of just a summary here, um, you have to read this book for the writing. If nothing else, just read it because the writing is beautiful. I've seen in many reviews online that he gets likened to so many of the uh, great um, kind of postmodern classic authors like James Joyce and William Faulkner and the list can go on and on and on, um, which I think is, is well worth it. Um, but his language, the way he, he uses it is also very quite accessible, so don't be pit off thinking that it's quite 
as experimental as, say, you know, James Joyce's later writing or William Faulkner's um, writing. It's, you can understand the story. Um, <laughs> and he's not just kind of inserting words wherever he finds, you know, fancy there. Anyways, um, so the author um, knows what the reader is actually thinking. By the author, I mean um, Richard Flanagan, the actual author of the book. Um, and he actually, he shatters your presumptions about the stereotypes of his characters because you kind of get these stereotypical characters of the insane leader, of, um, you know, the, I, the, the, the native helping the people, um, the settlers, um, and the convict artist, and he kind of takes these and he, he, he directly talks about them, but not to the author, but indirectly kind of, and like kind of takes these things and says, no, that's not why, you know, I became an artist. I became an artist because it, I had to. I mean, there's no other option. It was either this or become part of the chain game. It's like, I don't really value art that highly kind of thing. You know, like, you, he takes all these presumptions that we have about things and kind of shatters them. Um, I also think this novel is a perfect example of show, don't tell. Um, you know, you're not told of atrocious characters. You, the characters aren't aren't outright called bad guys kind of thing. They're not like me versus them type thing. It's kind of, you know, complicated characters. Like real life people are, are, are not all bad and all good. Um, but you do witness atrocious acts um, that these characters do. Um, it, it, I said before, it like blurs the line between the good guys and the bad guys. Um, it's a story told by a most unreliable narrator because first of all there's narrator narrator upon narrator um so the first kind of guess the first level of of billy gold is not really reliable because in one point you know he was sent to the penal colonies because he's a forger um and in one chapter he's like no i i didn't do any of this and then the next chapter he readily admits it so he's constantly changing you know, the story, and he's not reliable in the first place because he has forged things. And then you have a forger telling the story of a forger, um, because this, uh, this character, this hammock guy, um, used to forge furniture and stuff and sell it to tourists, saying that it was kind of old. Um, so when he finds his manuscript, people are telling him, like, you know, none of this stuff is real. Um, it's a really good forgery, though, because it all kind of tests out, you know, but uh, none of the stuff that he that happens historically ever actually happened. Um, there are also parts in this book where I don't want to th you to seem that it's this atrocious, unreliable, complicated story. But there are parts where you know you're laughing out loud because of what's happening or because of what you know is going to happen, and the author knows you know it's going to happen, and he kind of draws it out and plays with plays with you as a reader. Um, you know, and it's, I really felt connected to the characters, and not just the protagonist, but the antagonist as well, um, because they all kind of had their own um, story, their own moments, um, all kind of, you don't see it through their eyes, you see it through the eyes of William Gold. I'll stop with the whole narrator on, on narrator point here, but, um, and he also does a lot of commentary, actually, um, on on history, on um, European culture, uh, on um, colonialism, and as well as um, phrenology and eugenics um, about all this kind of false science that was going around at the time and he pokes fun at it um, and says, you know, like, you were wrong and I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> do this in kind of a funny, ironic kind of fashion way. Um, and the, the book works as so much more than just historical fiction, I find. Um, it manages to kind of uh, create a fantasy world within the real history by by taking you know some real place um, Tasmania specifically Sarah's Island and populating it with fantastical people um, and I think he really showed that um, characters are are what really kind of um, what kind of impact they have on an environment and what the environment has on them um but that you don't really have a story without these characters and that you can create a whole fantasy world without creating a whole new um world a whole new land for them to live in that you can do it in 
in history and that it was you know beautifully done um i really um actually liked um a shakespeare quote to kind of sum up um this novel and how it's told and kind of the themes and the whole purpose i felt behind the book um and it's from shakespeare's uh, macbeth you probably know what it is life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing and i'll leave it there um, let me know if you've read this book, um, if you've read any books that are like that where the writing is just so powerful to you um, that it just, it, it kind of makes every book that you read after it kind of pale in comparison, um, which is my problem right now. Uh, nothing I read after this is going to be as good. Um, so let me know what you're doing in the comments below and remember to keep on reading.